This is a debate in which the apologist Blake Junta tries to make a case for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you don't know already, the books of Luke and Acts together are called Luke-Acts because it's a two-volume work by the same author. Now, whether the author is actually Luke, uh, Professor Brown says scholarship's evenly divided. But no one denies that they have the same author. Tonight, we're just going to call him Fred. In Luke 1.1, Fred says his material has been carefully grounded in eyewitness testimony. And for several reasons, quote, this biographical understanding of the gospel genre has now become the accepted scholarly consensus. I think it's important to note that grounded in eyewitness testimony is not the same as eyewitness testimony. It is still hearsay. It is a secondhand account. What about the hallucination hypothesis? This, I don't know if you knew, this is the most popular naturalist explanation among historians today. This is also going to be on Belief Map soon, but in a nutshell, problems abound, and here are two. First, for several reasons, they would have known it was a hallucination. What reasons would those be? It is not at all uncommon for someone who has a hallucination to be totally oblivious to the fact that what they experienced was not real. It was even less uncommon before we had the scientific understanding of hallucinations that we have today. And second, hallucinations are like dreams. You can't share them and co-hallucinate. Not true. Hallucinations and delusions can be shared. The clinical term is shared psychotic disorder or induced delusional disorder. Two or more people who are prone to delusions can influence one another's delusions, and even one person prone to delusions can cause delusions in otherwise mentally healthy people. Also, Bart Ehrman points out that precisely those conservative evangelical scholars who claim that mass hallucinations don't happen are the ones who deny that the Blessed Virgin Mary has appeared to hundreds or thousands of people at once, even though we have modern, verified eyewitness testimony that she has. There's also a phenomenon called bereavement visions, in which people hallucinate that a recently deceased friend or family member has returned to visit them. Is it really so far-fetched to suppose that at least some of the appearances of Jesus are visions of this type? Carrier argues that they were simply congregating schizotypals, and schizotypals hallucinate more often. But it's easy to show the apostles weren't schizotypals. They don't need to be schizotypals to hallucinate. And in fact, Carrier's attempt just adds six more problems, and the original problems remain. For example, schizotypals also never group hallucinate. I doubt that schizotypals don't co-hallucinate, but as I said, they don't all need to be schizotypals to hallucinate or co-hallucinate. I'm going to leave the illusion hypothesis and futuristic uh, alien technology hypothesis for Q&A. But with just two sources, I think we've got a really good starter case. Um, now, people do exist who think that any of these explanations is better than saying that God raised Jesus, and that's because nobody comes to this question in a vacuum. It's because some people come to this question without the presupposition that a God exists. According to the CIA's World Factbook, 2% of people do believe that there is no God of any kind. In America, it's 3%. If you are entirely confident that no, Jesus, that, excuse me, that no God exists, then maybe group hallucination is more sensible for you. First of all, there are quite a few non-Christian theists who also find hallucination to be more sensible. Secondly, even if you're a theist, in order to find divine intervention more sensible than mass delusion, you have to assume not only that a god exists, but also that the probability of that god's intervention is greater than the probability of mass delusion. On what basis can you infer that? Thirdly, I think you understand that you're not going to convince many atheists that Jesus rose from the dead if you recognize that your argument is only compelling to people who believe that a god exists. A striking number of lay atheists believe that there was never a historical Jesus either. Um, Matt himself is agnostic about it, so I would give a lecture on that too, and, and why today there's not one teaching historian in the world at Cambridge, Harvard, Oxford, anywhere who doubts Jesus' existence. I don't know if that's true, but even if it is, why specify teaching historians? There are legitimate, credentialed historians who doubt the existence of Jesus. I'm not a mythicist, I believe that Jesus probably existed, but arbitrarily excluding legitimate historians is slimy casuistry. So I think God exists and Jesus is a real historical figure, but there's an important last question, which is, would God raise Jesus? I think the best explanation simply says, look around. Dead people stay dead. If there is a God, raising people from the dead obviously isn't as a style. And so in response, I want to explain why Jesus is special and why God might uniquely choose to raise Jesus from death. But according to the Bible, he didn't uniquely choose to raise Jesus from death. As Christopher Hitchens said, After all, Lazarus was raised, never said a word about it. The daughter of Jairus was raised, didn't say a thing about what she'd been through. 
Um, and the Gospels tell us that at the time of the crucifixion, all the graves in Jerusalem opened, and their occupants wandered around the streets to greet. Uh, so that it seems the resurrection was a, a, a something of a banality at the time. Not all, <laughs> not all of those people clearly were divinely uh, conceived. But even if Jesus was the only person to ever return from the dead, it would not follow that he was raised by a god or that he is God. It would not follow that any of his teachings were true or that he deserves to be worshipped. Because the supernatural isn't something that we can demonstrate, and so we can't use it as a probable explanation until that demonstration has occurred. We have no way to confirm the existence of the supernatural or that it can interact with the natural world. And every time we hear somebody say, the cause must be supernatural, I have yet to see an example that wasn't because I can't think of any natural cause. That is a fallacy, period. If you'd like to help support my work, I do have a Patreon.